Good afternoon, everyone, once again. Thank you for joining this webinar offered by the European uh, School Education Platform, uh, the European Commission's platform for school education in Europe. My name is Marjolaine and I will be the hostess of this session. Again, uh, this is the recorded webinar and all the material with the presentation as well will be uploaded on the European School Education Platform uh, in the coming days. Uh, before we begin, I would like to remind you of some technicalities. Uh, following the general data protection regulations, your microphones and your cameras uh, have been disabled. However, uh, we invite you to share any thoughts, uh, any questions uh, in the chat, and um, our speaker would, uh, will gladly uh, reply to you towards the end of the session. Of course, if you're facing any technical issues, please let us know in the chat and we will try um, to help you. So, uh, stay with us uh, until the end of the webinar and uh, to learn more about uh, the upcoming learning events of the European uh, School Education Platform, but also provide us uh, with some feedback that uh, always helps us improve. Let's uh, start now. For uh, this webinar, we have invited Professor Elsa Erskodir. Sorry, <laughs> her last name is uh, a bit uh, difficult for me to pronounce, but it's a very unique and amazing uh, last name, Elsa. Elsa is a professor at the University of Iceland uh, in the Department of School uh, of Education. Her uh, research interests uh, focus mostly on vocational education and training, upper secondary education, uh, skill acquisition, learning and uh, transfer of training. Today, uh, with her help, we will delve uh, deeper into the topic of vocational education and training and, of course, how to get uh, more young people to choose uh, to participate, to enroll into vocational education institutions. And uh, we will also discuss uh, the standing of, of vocational education and young students' perceptions about VET in uh, Iceland. Uh, with no further delays, maybe Elsa, you can uh, start sharing your screen. Thank you, Marilena. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm going to see if I can share my slides. Um, okay. Can you see my slides then? Yes, yes, we can see them okay. clearly. Okay, great. I'm ready. Okay. So, thank you again for inviting me to have this webinar with you. I'm excited to um, explore this issue and why students choose vocational education pathways. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight of what I'm talking about uh, is this general thing is that when students go into upper secondary education, they can choose either general academic programs or vocational programs. And this is a generalization, but it seems to hold true for a lot of uh, the countries. As you can see here in Education at a Glance from 2024, in a, uh, published by OECD, they say for many students, transitioning from lower to upper secondary education involves choosing between general education and vocational education and training. So this is a general mechanism. Now, uh, this choice is very different depending on the country. So here we have a figure showing the percentages of initial vocational education training students in the EU and some EU countries, um, both in 2015 and then 2021. And as you can see here, um, on average, about 50% of students choose to go into vocation, uh, initial vocational education training. But as you can see, the variation is from 70% down to 18%. But we can also see that there's a rather stable percentage over time. So in those uh, intervening years, these six years, uh, I think Hungary is one of the exceptions here. Um, another way to look at it is by age, but here we have the same numbers from the OECD report uh, from 2023. And here you have the OECD average, which is around 47%, if I'm correct. Um, so, no, 37, sorry. Um, of all upper secondary students aged between 15 and 19 are pursuing a vocational program. But of course, the range here is from, as you can see, 70% uh, down to uh, less than 5%. And here, what we also, what we see here, which is uh, different from the figure before, is the age. So we can see if we have the average across age, we have a different picture. So this is often um, the choice for more mature students. And I will come back to that when I talk about Iceland specifically. 
So this is just to give you that there's a wide variability in terms of who chooses a vocational education and whether it's considered a problem in national education systems. But for quite some time, it has been an educational policy in Europe to get more young people to choose vocational pathways. Here's an example. This is a data insight report from 2024. And here is the clear ask the question. This is CETEPOP, which is the European Center for Development of Vocational Training. And they ask, is initial vocational education training an attractive learning choice? And a key aim of the EU educational training policy is to promote initial, initial vocational education training as an attractive choice. And here they reference both the Osnabrück Declaration and the Council of Recommendation from 2020. So this has been uh, quite some time a policy. And the same applies to the Nordic countries, including Iceland. So here is something from the synthesis report from CETEFOP, the future of vocational education training in Europe. And here you can see um, this is Iceland is one of those systems which has a low share of vocational education and training. It is a dual system here. Uh, we can see in another table from that same report that in, it falls under the heading of increasing youth and decreasing vet participation. And here we also have Denmark and Sweden, where the same concern is, is definitely been prevalent. So you can see this is definitely an international phenomena and it really applies to the Nordic countries and Iceland as well. Um, so if we go back to talking about Iceland specifically, this has been a policy discussion since the middle of last century. Uh, there was a policy document I found from 1943, which has the exact same wording to em emphasis getting more young people to choose vocational education that we have for the last uh, coalition government. So this has really hasn't changed a lot. And this has been specific policy of the last two government coalitions. We have over 95% of each cohort of young people entering up a secondary education, but only about 15% of those uh, choose VET. But overall, we have about a third going into VAT if you look at the system as a whole, which is lower than the EU and OECD averages. But the differences we have here in the percentages fit from 15 to the third is usually because we have second chance students coming in or people changing the paths and older students coming back after maybe finishing their um, higher education degrees because it's a very open system that we have. So we have about a third of the system, but not a lot of the students choosing it directly from uh, compulsory education. So given the widespread policy emphasis on getting more young people to choose vocational education, we need to understand why and why not students choose to go this way. So that's what my focus is, is in looking at the standing of vocational education as a factor in deciding between academic and vocational pathways. And here I'm talking about upper secondary schools, and I'll return to that. I'm going to discuss what the choices and rationale are for young people selecting their upper secondary school pathways and how that relates to the perception of vocational education. And discussing this issue, I'm going to be using the results from Iceland uh, as an example. Um, this is, of course, what I know best, but also it has a low VAT participation in comparison to other EU countries. It is a very open educational system, which means there are not a lot of tracking. There's not a lot of uh, directing students in, in certain direction. They can come into schools and out of and change directions. So we can see a lot about what they choose from a system like that. And of course, in talking about all of this, some of the issue I'm discussing might be very country specific. So I try to give you context so you can understand that. But others are more general. So this is an overview of the rest of the talk, as I already started. Um, I'm going to talk about the standing of vocational education training in general, kind of what goes into choosing vocational education, then VET in Iceland to give you the context, and then why vocational education, some example from my current research. And these are three examples, and I'm just going to be picking some things to show you from each of those, um, and then some conclusions about that. Okay. So let's start by talking about the standing of vocational education and training. Just for you to consider, if you think about vocational education, what is the standing in your country or your community? How is it viewed? Is there more respect for academic education? And if so, why do you think that is? Why does it hold this position? So bear that in mind. This is kind of what I was coming from when I was looking at this issue. 
But generally, the disparity between academic and vocational pathways has been long considered problematic. And here I'm showing a picture of a book that is outstanding, published in 2022. It really delves into this issue, so I recommend it if you're interested. Academic education usually enjoys a higher status. It has a general focus, prepares for higher education. It is also considered key for upward mobility, and it relates to the general academic drift and increased demand for university education that we see in most education systems. But vocational education is considered more of a dead end in the educational system and has a very narrow focus and not always a, a access to higher education, which sometimes is more of a perception than a reality, but it also can be a reality. Um, there is emphasis on employability, market readiness and individual responsibility, which can also have a fact for future social position and prospects in terms of having not the general academic knowledge often required for society. We can see different um, manifestation of the lower uh, standing of vocational education. For example, lower participation, which is a lot of things that I'm going to be talking about. Um, increased dropout, lower graduation rates. It's often considered the pathway for those with lower academic achievements. And we see a larger percentage of lower socioeconomic status student, students uh, concentrated in vocational pathways. And that's the same in Iceland. We see that vocational students are generally with lower SES, less educated parents, less prior academic achievement, and less likely to expect to pursue higher education compared to academic students. We also see that the admission criteria into academic programs is more stringent. They expect more uh, achievement. There's no dropout in that. And then we had this coalition agreements and education policy, which has really set out loud that it has a lower status and we need to enhance the status. So it's really um, given in Iceland. And as I told you before, most upper secondary school students choose academic pathways. And the average age of vocational students is quite higher than the academic students, which kind of shows that this is a choice that they make later, either by when returning or after finishing another studies or by changing the pathways. Now, despite efforts uh, to increase vocational participation for the last two decades, we haven't really seen a lot of changes in Iceland. And in 2017, the Icelandic National Audit Office reported um, that despite these efforts, that really has only been decreased participation. So there was a, I was just saying like we've spent all this money, involved all these people, but nothing's really is moving. But we've had some indication of increased interest in the past few years. We have increased rejection rates into vocational programs, 19% in 2022, which caused a lot of outcry. Um, the word of mouth and news and opinion pieces are all agreement that, you know, now young people want vocational education, but we don't really know what's going on. Um, official apl application analysis is not available, and so we don't see how this interest has developed over time and where. So they talk about increased interest of young people straight from compulsory education, which is important because this is a priority group in admissions. So if we have limited spaces, and we I, I have data that we have actually fewer places available in school. This means older students are pushed out. But of course, if we have fewer places, we have higher rejection rates. So what really is going on? And also we have to consider that vocation education is an umbrella term. So where does this interest really lie? Because there's a lot of different vocational fields and sectors. And then is this a long term or temporary change? What is this following? So all of this kind of come together to um, for me to try to figure out, okay, how do how does this choice happen? What is influencing? There's a lot of factors here. So just discussing uh, the choices and coming into this question, why would young people choose vocational education was my thought. Why would they choose this? And what shapes their decision making when they choose this pathway at the upper secondary level? So think for yourself, like, how would you approach this question? Now, for me, um, the explanations for the preferences of academic pathways are right, but they relate to this kind of esteem differences between vocational and academic pathways. And I've been thinking about this, that I thought it could be approached from two angles. You can look at theories and research what determines educational career choice, which is uh, vocational psychology or occupational career counseling. This is not my area of expertise, but I kind of 
dug into it a little bit, but I'm just going to talk about it in very short terms here, because my focus is really on the second part, which is specifically looking at the choice between academic and vocational pathways. And that's related in my mind to the issue of parity of esteem. So if you look at areas of education choice, just to give you an insight, um, the dominant uh, theories are person environment fit and the importance of interest. So what they refer to there is the fit between the characteristics of the person and the vocational environment. And if you have a fit, that leads to a positive outcomes. And here, interest is a key concept describing the characteristics of the person. But research, and research has supported this, but they have been criticized as not taking other factors into account, which is when we come to uh, structural theories and such theories that take the role of social background and prior experiences into account, uh, such as socioeconomic stat status and gender, and how those factors delimit educational opportunities and their choices. And then there are other theories that focus both on social and cognitive dimensions, such as when you're talking about self-efficacy, which is where your belief in how you perform in certain areas and outcome expectations. And then we also need to think about how do people make decisions? Um, is they, do they deliberate what they want to do? Is it spontaneous? And here, of course, age and experience should play a role. So a lot of moving pieces here. But when we talk about academic and vocational um, choices, there's a variety of factors that play a role and none are necessarily dominant. I'm going to talk about some of the factors that we know from prior research in Iceland that this affects their choices. So we know that parental background and influence is important. Parents tend to direct the children towards academic programs. They want to keep the path to higher education open, keep all your options open. And this is especially seems true with parents with their own university degrees and highest socioeconomic status. It's also related to the opportunities, access to resources and higher grades. So this all kind of, this all fits together really. Um, and academic programs generally in our system require higher grades uh, or prior achievement than vocational if they want to enter. We also know that peer group relationships are important where friends intend to study influences decision and those entering academic pathways are more likely to follow the friends are less committed to choice. And there's some indication that a lack of peer group relationship makes it easier for students to choose that, but we need to look at a little bit deeper into that. Then there's the reputation of school um, in Iceland. These are young people and the active having an active social life and extracurricular activities is very important in when they decide what to well, where to go for study. And that schools and programs seem to have worse reputation. And this might be due because they have older students, which might not be focused in the same social uh, activities. Then role models. There are some indications that that student is more likely to have parents with the same background and gender is it's very obvious because that education, at least in Iceland and no, uh, in many other areas, is very gendered and more fields here are, are male dominated. It seems like uh, the female fields have more been pushed to higher education. And then there's this just what do they know when they're making this choice? Do they know about careers? Do they know about educational pathways? And there are some that say that choosing an academic pathway and keeping all your options open and delaying that choice is very desirable that that's how it should be. They're not old enough to make this choice. And there is this perception of that as a dead end and it's narrowing down your choices, which might not necessarily be true. Um, and then how much do the students really know about vocational education and the careers that follow? And then there's this role of personal experience through work or knowledge from family and friends. Uh, this is the background, and let me give you a little bit of context of how VET is uh, structured in Iceland. So just to give you a background for those who don't know, it's a very small country, an island. We have 380,000 people here. Most of us, uh, two-thirds, live in the capital area of Reykjavik, which is here in dark green. And then we have, for instance, uh, the rest scattered around the coast. The next largest uh, density area is in Akureyri up north here it has 20,000 inhabitants. So you can see from this, this is a challenge to provide a variety of educational choices to people living outside Reykjavik. So of course, how close you are to school makes a difference in how uh, easy it is for you to, to you know, choose something that's maybe not offered there. And the system is uh, shown here, I'm not gonna go into it, but just say that at upper secondary education is what I'm focusing on. And that's the ages 16 to 90 or 23 to four years. 
And as I said earlier, there's about majority of each cohort goes into upper secondary schools or the green um, step there. The 30 upper secondary schools, 13 of them offer vocational programs and 13 of them are in around Reykjavik, five of those with vocational programs. And they're very different in size. Some are very small and some are huge. So that also uh, makes a challenge. We have two types of school, comprehensive, um, that have both uh, academic and vocational programs, and then grammar schools, which have no vocational programs. And there are these two pathways in general, the general academic programs, which end with matriculation, which has uh, traditionally been the university entrance exam, and then vocational programs that some leads to journeyman's exam, or and then you can add a couple of semesters to graduate with matriculation. So it's not a dead end in a sense, but it adds, you have to add on to matriculate in the same way. We have a free school choice across the country. So it's a one school district. So students anywhere can apply to any school, which means we have a market-based competition and schools set their own admission criteria. So it's a very um, not controlled system in terms of how students choose what they want. So that's why I've looked at admissions data, application data, because it tells you a little bit about what students want to study. So we have uh, what we call the certified trades or the licensed or regulated trades, which is the largest section of vocational programs where you need a journeyman certificate to work in the field. These are hard hairdressers, carpenters, electricians, plumbers, car mechanics, and so on. But we also have some vocations that where you need just to complete the studies and apply to license to practice, such as the nurses' aides and so on, mostly in the, in the health field or medical fields. But the certified trades are the biggest part of the system. And they usually include some work-based learning, sometimes organized with school, but in the certified trades, it's always an apprenticeships or dual system. And um, it's very, the duration of it differs quite a bit from 24 up to 126 weeks. So it's a, so it's a, each field varies quite a bit in the system. Okay, so going into the research project as a whole, so my aim was to investigate the standing um, in comparison of uh, sending of vocational education in comparison to the academic pathways through the lens of educational choice. What does it tell us about how students and society view vocational education? And so for me, understanding who is interested in vocational education and who is not uh, helps us understand why they don't choose it, why they do choose it, and why these efforts to increase the standing of education education have failed and how can we then target our future efforts in this area and i will give here three simple examples from different parts of the project so first uh, talking about the upper secondary school application patterns over a period of time and then rational graduate vet students and then reasons for current student educational choices okay so let me start by looking at the application patterns so these are kind of the questions that I considered when starting out with. Um, so who chooses that? So I was looking at that in Iceland. What characterizes this group? And what you can ask your same, what characterizes this group in your country? Who chooses that? And when, which fields does that include there? Because it really differs across countries. Some have all the same uh, fields, but we often have very different fields that we say are vocational education. Anyway, so... Um, I was looking at application patterns over time for vocational and academic pathways. I'm not going to be talking about other factors than the general outline and then by age and sector, so not about gender or school location. And the data is uh, from the Directorate of Education in Iceland and all, includes all application to upper secondary education from 2006 to 2022. In 2005, I had some uh, data from 2005. Right, some limitations, I'm not going to dig into that. Um, so here we have the overview. We have uh, the blue line is the academic programs, the green line is the vocational programs, and then I'll mention the uh, red line, which is preparation programs. So this are, these are programs for students that don't have the required, required competency at the end of compulsory education to enter programs in upper secondary school. So they have to get some go to preparation programs and then they can select programs in upper secondary schools. So what we see here is about 40-50% of application each year are for academic programs. So this is only increased over time, so there doesn't seem to be any change here. Um, 
about 30, 40% of application each year of a vocation program. And we can see a very clear um, rise in this percentage from 2018 onwards. Um, maybe a little fluctuation, we have to look at the newest data. And this big decrease in application to preparation programs uh, over time, from 30% to about 6 or 7%. So that's a huge decrease. So we're wondering how much of that decrease are students moving into either both academic programs and then vocational programs. So these are lower achievement students. And some of the reason for the lowering of this line is also because we disbanded some standardized tests that determined where students could go and we changed the grading system and the compulsory education. So some different reasons, but these students are going somewhere else and I think they're going in the majority into a vocational education. But you can see that most applications are either into these two types of pathways. So here we have an age group and you can see we have very different um, patterns here. So of those applied to academic programs, the largest are the youngest group. So we have 70 to 80 percent of the youngest cohort going into academic programs and very little changed over time. As we can see some effects of the economic collapse there, um, but not much happening else. Um, and the same here, very little change over time. So we can see that there's an equal percentage of age groups, which means we have a very, very different student group composition in vocational programs than we do for academic programs. And you can see even the 25 years or older are the biggest percentage of the groups here. Okay, if you look at vocational fields, and I'm going to explain this picture, so don't worry. Um, it's quite complex. So I have here different lines for different sectors. This is the same picture uh, copied, just to make it a little bit more understandable. So you have from 2006 to 2022 in both pictures, uh, just to clarify. So let me just talk you through this. So here we have the building and construction and electrical fields, the blue one and green lines. So we can see increased in application in past four years has mostly been driven by the application into these two fields. And these are predominantly male. So it tells us a little bit of what's going on. So this is driven by the uh, building boom that's been going on in, in Iceland. Then we have the uh, colonial arts, for example. We see a different pattern there. We see increased steadily over the past decade, which is related to the tourist boom in Iceland, then COVID hit and so on. So we see variation from the economic um, situation. Beauty and hairdressing, we have a drop there from 2012 onwards. Um, there's a steady debt decline and this is one of the fields that's been really talked about as having not a lot of apprenticeship. We also see fewer schools. So there's something going on here. So very, very different patterns based on the different sectors. And then here uh, I just mentioned three different sectors, maritime and navigation, information technology, and then office and commercial fields kind of look very similar in the curves, but we have probably very, very different reasons for these declines. One has to do with the technology, information technology. We don't do a lot of printing anymore in Iceland, so that's very natural. In the office and commercial fields, a lot of those programs went into academic programs and they stopped being vocational. So how, you know, what, how do we interpret this? So we can see the S sector that we're talking about makes a big difference. Okay, so just sum up this first part. We have the overall application pattern. So academic pathways is the main pathway but we can see that there's an increase in vocational application in the past few years. But young people, they choose academic programs and older applicants choose vocational programs. So there's very little indication, as the news articles were saying here, that young people are increasingly interested in vocational programs. And then we see very different trajectories over time for different vocational sectors. So this seems to, uh, shows us the effect of economic conditions and the importance of looking at the sector separately. So this is kind of the bird's eye view of the system and the choice. So next I'm going to consider the rationale and reasons students give for the educational choice, which leads us to example two. So this is the rationale of graduated vet students for the choice. So here, just to set you in the right frame of mind, if you think back to your own choice of pathway, what do you say now would have had determined your choice and how deliberate was your choice? And this is a little bit what I was trying to get at. So I wanted to map the rationale of recently vocational graduates and why they chose this field, and especially considering the role of prior work experience and knowledge of the field. 
So this is a question of data that are collected in 2017, part of an uh, investigation into the dual system in Iceland. But here I was looking at, because I had the data, I was looking at what can I see from it. So these were all uh, recently graduated journeymen, past five years. Um, and I had 319 responses, so I'm not going to go into the details on the study itself, but I asked them, did you have any knowledge about the trade before you started your studies? And here you can see um, that 27% of them had worked in a trade before, and then 44% of them had some knowledge, either from the parents or family members or friends. And then we had Fourth, that said we had, I did not have any knowledge of the trade. So they were really just entering the field very cold, if you know what I mean. But taken together, if you talk also about them that had knowledge from somewhere else, 76% of the participants had worked or had some prior knowledge. So they really had some idea what goes on in, in this field. And then I asked them, why did you choose this? So this was an open question, and 154 participants answer this. So I analyzed these answers thematically, um, and these are the themes that came up. So we can see there's interest in the trade, interest in the job, interest in practical fields like working with their hands. It's a practical choice, it's a coincidence. I was choosing away from academics. I worked in the field influenced by family and friends, or they didn't provide a clear reason. So the largest percentage involved interest in the trade, in the job, or in practical fields. Altogether, 62% of the reasons provided. Other reasons, much less, much less common. Just to give you an example of those fields. The interest in the trade, either general or specific, this was my favorite thing to do, an interest machinery, something like that. When they talked about the interest in a job, this was really, it's my dream job, it's such a fun and diverse job, I had intended to become an electrician since I was a kid. So these are obviously related or overlapping categories, so about 50% of the um, provided answers. Then there was this interest in practical fields. I like taking things apart and putting back together. I wanted to work in a practical field. I've always been good in my hands. And often what related here is to mention that, you know, I don't like the academics. And that's also a category here. So I was choosing away from academics. I have difficulty with academic course. Just chose something where I didn't have to study Danish, which is a required subject in Iceland. And teachers thought I was bad at school and told me this was the only thing I could do. So various reasons, but negative ideas about academic subjects. OK, so just to sum up some of those um, topics here. So we can see that prior experience and knowledge of the field is important and suggest a little bit of different pathways and trajectories into these fields and kind of the complexities of the reasons that might be different for different groups based on age or experience, social environment and relationships, so on. So it, it shows us the complexity of the issue. And they discuss interest as the main motivator for choice, uh, which fits well with dominant theories on educational choice, but other reasons were provided, so social environment was obviously there. This is hindsight after graduations, and this is a limited example and successful vocational students that finished their degrees. So I wanted information from students a little bit closer to the decision process, which leads us to the third example, which is the reasons for current students' educational choices. So here, um, the questions that, you know, kind of for the baseline from my uh, thinking here is to think about the choice of academic or vocational purpose. Do you think it's determined by the same factors? So should we just disband this idea of going to vocational or academic? Is it always the same things that decide where students go? And how much do you think prior experience or knowledge of a field influences these choices? Okay, so do that to study the reason students in upper secondary school uh, provide for having chosen to study what they do. I uh, managed to put up some questions into a national study on upper secondary education that was put to all of the upper secondary school and all of the students in the upper secondary school in Iceland the last winter. So we had 7,010 completed responses and most of them are in the age range of the students in the school. So we didn't have the night school or school that are some uh, programs that are something oriented towards the older students, um, but it gives us some ideas here. So if we look at programs that are um, the respondents uh, belong to, uh, most of them belong to academic programs, or so 60%, and then we had uh, about 24% in vocational programs. So overall, most participants were either enrolled in academic or vocational programs. 
And those are the ones that I looked at uh, moving onwards. So I asked what mattered the most when you were applying for studying after secondary school, that they could choose maximum of four statements that they felt best applied to them as closest to home, which kind of relates back to the geographical um, challenges that I described earlier. The field I'm interested in is only taught there, which is the case for some vocational fields that are only taught in one school in Iceland. Social life, extracurricular calendar, good choice for further education, how well it prepares me for a job after finishing, depending on my group of friends, school facilities, my parents attended the school, parents' advice, possibilities of earning a good salary, prior experience, uh, working in the field or related fields, interest in the field, I wanted to choose vocational, the program is practical, coincidence, and so on. Okay, so here we see what they chose. Let me focus first on the vocational programs. So these are the ones that provide this uh, higher percentage than the academics. And the first is that the field of interest is only taught there. And that is very understandable given um, that there's less options for vocational studies. We also have how well it prepares me for job after finishing, and then interest in the field, if it is also quite high for the academic uh, students as well, but less so. And I wanted to choose a vocational, which is kind of um, expected. But here I thought it was interesting. So even if we have this difference in for the uh, prior experience working in the field or in related fields, uh, there's very, I think, 7% of vocational students cite this as a reason. So, but we have this difference. Looking at academic programs, they're focused on the social life, the extracurricular calendar, good choice for further education, dependent on my group of friends, school facilities, which is also quite high though for also vet students, parents advice, which came though also up to nearly 8%, I think, from uh, vocational students. So very different constellation of factors that they cite as the motivator for their choice. And here I want to mention also this category close to home. There was no difference here, but you see that this is a very important category for students in Iceland and it determines the choice. So these students are not maybe choice, having a deliberate choice for a career. They're having a choice that is related to where they live first and foremost. Okay, so then I asked, uh, asked them, what was your prior knowledge about or experience in the field? And this is only for the vocational students. So four of the participants had prior work experience, which means that only about 17% of those 299 that said that had prior work experience said that this uh, mattered when they were choosing what to study for secondary school. So they had the experience, but they don't really cite it as a reason for why they chose what they did. And then we have 68% had some knowledge. And overall, we see 93% of those in vocational programs had prior experience or knowledge of the field from somebody close to them. It's a lot higher than what we saw in when they gave the reasons for um, why they choose what they did. Then I asked them, are you choosing away from a pathway? Uh, the vocational student asked them, I chose this program because I did not want to enroll in an academic program, how well that applied to them, this statement. And here we have about two thirds that this statement applied to them. They did not want to choose an academic, which is not really unexpected given what we already seen. We did the same for academic students. I chose this because they did not want to enroll in a vocational program. And here we have even 43% of the statement applied to them, uh, which is higher than I expected. So to some of these things, uh, the vocational students, the field was only taught at the school, they were interested in it, they wanted to choose vocational, how well they prepared them for a job, different factors for the academic student, the social life, future education, school facilities and friends. And vocational students more likely to choose away, but also the academic students. This of course is self-report. So. Um, here we can see for about the experience and prior knowledge, this was the case for most of the majority of the uh, vet students, but they did not cite this as an influence of their choice. Okay, so just to sum up some of the conclusions, I think, yeah, before I run out of time here. So the overall aim, just to refresh your memories, was to investigate the standing of vocational education um, in comparison to academic pathways and looking at how that's manifested by the educational choice. So who chooses that? We see that older students, returning students, or those changing pathways, is men rather than women. I didn't show you that graph, but that's also one of my findings. 
And then we see that the selection of that is very different for vocational sector and the impact of economic conditions seems quite clear. So we have to look at that as part of the whole puzzle if we want to consider how to get more young people to invest in vocational education. So why did the graduate student choose VET? Um, they cite interest first and foremost by the, in the field, in the job, in the practical, but there's also cite some other practical reasons. And here, I think we see this might vary by age. Um, and we saw that prior no experience and knowledge were very common. And then looking at the current school students, um, we saw that very different reasons provided for the two groups. Again, prior experience and knowledge were very common, but here they were not really cited as an influence for choice, even though the majority of the vet students really knew something about the field that they were entering. So we can see that the uh, vocational education in Iceland is not the first choice, especially not for young people or women. And we can ask, is the vocational education at the right education level? Should we put it at a higher level, meaning that students have to prepare more and we delay this choice, would that help? Uh, we can also see the prevalence of strongly gendered labor market. Um, so it really, this is a societal issue. It's not just a vocational issue that we need to think about. And I think it's quite, it says a lot about the standing that almost half of the academic student did not see that as an option at all. So there was never an option for them. And about this current increased interest in vocational pathways, um, whether that's a very promising sign or not, as they're discussing here in the media, it's mostly driven by particular field or sectors. Um, and then there's this question whether this decrease in the preparation program is a shift between categories and increasing application to vocational education. We don't really know. I think we need to investigate this better. But not neither of those things seem to promise a lot of increase in vocation and attendance in the future. And then I think I'm quite struck by the importance of prior experience and knowledge. We can see it both for current and graduated students. So we can see maybe there are very different paths into choosing vocational education by experience, by age, and just some alternative ways of recruitment and a very important part of something like validation of prior learning into getting students to choose that and a having kind of a priority pass for those students into the system. And also shows us the importance of role model and the social environment in shaping the choices of young people. And then we have, the, of course, the ge geographical challenge, which is a question what we can do, do with here. The importance of interest, well, it fits very well with those theories that I talked about, but we saw also the social and economic environment, uh, the practicalities, whether it worked in the field, influence of family friends. Self-efficacy might be seen here as, a, as a, both a positive for those already working in the field. They see that they can do it, that, yeah, that increases their interest, and it gives them positive reinforcement of like, I can know I can do it, I can make it in this field. And then there's this negative uh, factor, which is that they've been in academic studies, they don't have a good experience with it, so they avoid the academics. So self-efficacy can work in both ways here. And then I'm kind of intrigued by coincidence as a category for choice. And this question about how deliberate are these decisions? How deliberately are young people choosing what to do? Because you can see in the constellation of different factors that it seems to underlie these decisions. Some are very kind of um, related to a specific issue. If you think about a location, for instance, so they're really not choosing a, a field or a career. But of course, here we need to consider this is self-reported information. They might have in hindsight bias. There are all kinds of issues with how much we can rely on this information. But I think it gives us some, some uh, indications that we can work with. And I also want to say at the last moment here, I want to do more. Um, so the next steps are quite obvious. I want to do interviews with both students in the process of choosing, students kind of returning, so on. Investigate these different paths into vocational education based on background factors specifically. And then also kind of consider this vocational education as a single category, whether it makes sense to talk about it that way. Um, but that's maybe a bigger philosophical issue. But I think that's it for me. So I just want to thank you very much for attending and your attention. And I'm open for questions if there are any. And I think Maria Elena is going to navigate those, right? Yes, uh, of course, Elsa, I will. 
Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, presenting so interesting findings. Uh, to be honest, my field is not vocational education, education and training, and uh, I was very surprised. And I would like to uh, read the comment that we just received uh, from uh, Kerstin. Uh, many findings are what I observed in Germany as well, but the prior experience is something I didn't observe around here. Uh, and maybe wondering, but uh, I might not have asked students about it. And uh, indeed, that, that was a very interesting finding. And uh, I also wanted to comment something on that. Basically, um, I have one question myself, if I am allowed, <laughs> if I can uh, uh, have this question. But first, uh, let's discuss a bit about this, about the prior experience. Uh, I don't know, do you have any insights about this? And how is it possible for, I, I don't know, for a, for a student to have like prior experience? Of course, I know there are many students that work sometimes, but uh, at the same time, base their, uh, let's say, future career on maybe a slight uh, prior experience. I don't know. Really yeah, like I think this is uh, interesting. I'm glad that you brought this up because I think this differs quite a lot by countries. Um, as I said earlier, we have a very open system. It's very easy to enter, very easy to exit. So we have a high dropout, but sometimes it's because people delay um, their upper secondary education. It's very common here. It's like, okay, I want to save up and get a car. So I stop working for a semester, I stop studying for a semester, go and work, and then I come back. And it's there's not a lot of punishment for it. Um, so students um, to do that a lot. So there's a lot of in and out. We also have this situation where there's a high employment of young people here. Um, it's very normal that people, I think most People don't remember the exact percentage that we had in the same um, questionnaire that I showed you the last part from, but it's very high. A lot of students work while they uh, while they study. I mean, and then many of them are also attending apprenticeships, so they might uh, kind of incorporate that into the study time. So there's a lot of um, different ways that they have work experiences very young and they have maybe, you know, dropped up for a while, come back. So work experience is very high for students at this age or young people at this age here. So I think that's quite unusual, but probably we see some component of this. And I remember one student, um, one answer that I want to tell you about was a guy in plumbing. So he was studying to become a plumber and we asked him like, why are you studying this? I just randomly got this job through somebody that I knew, you know, working in this shop that sold this plumbing equipment. I didn't know anything about it, but after working there for a couple of months, I realized I knew a lot of things about it. Then some customer came in and I just asked him, hey, do you need an apprentice? I mean, I might just study that because I didn't know what I want to do. So it was completely random that he ended there, but he found himself in this um, position. So I think that's a kind of an example of a story that one student would tell. That's a very interesting story, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone else uh, have a question, something that you would like maybe to highlight any, um, I don't know if you uh, can identify any similarities uh, with the country that you live and you teach in. Um, if, of course, if someone has any input, uh, please feel free to post it um, on uh, the chat. And maybe in the meantime, I can uh, uh, address my question right now. <laughs> sure. So basically, uh, you mentioned that uh, there are a lot of a lot of uh, students who have already graduated from a first. Uh, they already uh, have a first degree, uh, maybe from the academia or something. And after they finish, they 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 come back to vocational education and training to obtain a more te technical degree. Let's say. Uh, do you think that using their voices? uh using them as influencers if i may say uh they could i don't know influence the opinion of younger students uh, towards vet because it's it's very interesting to see that there are a lot of uh, older uh, people uh like 25 year, years old and older you mentioned that that come back for vet i don't know maybe using their experiences maybe using their voices what do you think 
I think that's right. I mean, I think uh, some of these can be a good role model that you can go different routes and 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 why because they have probably very clear reason for the choices. So having them discussing these uh, choices for younger people is, I think, can be quite important. Um, but there's also a downside because one of the reasons that these people are in the vocational system with the younger students is because this is a small system. So ha we don't have a lot of option for um, older students to go into their own program. We have some cases of a night school where they are situated and the younger students are at a day school. But in many cases, these are taught together, which can be very beneficial. Um, so I've sat in classes observing where we have older students acting as mentors and teachers for younger students. So they are maybe collaborating because they're more vocal. They might have experience. They troubleshoot. They think about things in different ways. So I've seen that happen spontaneously. The negative part is that you can see from the data that I showed you that the academic students were really looking at other things when they're considering their choices, the social life, the friends and so on. And if you have a lot of older student experience coming back into the vocational program, it changes the community, it changes the tenor and the kind of the, the social life of the institution and the programs. So that can have like a negative effect, I think, for some students that might want to choose this, but they also want to have a young person's experiences in upper secondary school. So they might choose then rather to follow something else. But I think you're right. I think we can use the uh, young people that are coming back to schools and that are, you know, the, uh, those are studying, use them as role models and recruiters even and going into. And I know that there are now in certain compulsory schools in Iceland for them students in, in the 10th grade or the last two grades of the upper, of the compulsory education, the lower secondary, they have the options of taking as a choice um, some, some classes in the vocational studies from the local um, upper secondary school. So they have this kind of uh, system where you can kind of see what's going on offer and that might help them make a choice. And of course, those people in the programs there would then be essential for recruiting those youngsters into the programs. I don't know if that answered your question, but some considerations. <laughs> you did, you did, you did. And uh, well, that's that's very nice to hear. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, I'm from Greece, so I don't know if you have something similar to have, let's say, not exactly preparatory year, but giving the option to the students to to see, to experience uh, uh, some courses from uh, vocational education uh, institutions. And uh, well, yeah, indeed, that would be very, very nice. That would be very helpful for them to also understand what's vocational education and training, because, because usually you're not taught, you're not taught this in the school. Um, you're giving very specific options, more, let's say, theoretical. And uh, yeah, then the parents come uh, in the <laughs> in the front stage, the, the friends, of course, the environment. And um, I don't know, maybe we have a few more minutes, maybe one last question. Maybe also the participants are interested to hear it. I, if I'm not mistaken, I think um, there are some Erasmus Plus projects. Now I'm going to the gender, let's say, um, mm -hmm. yeah, to the gender part. I think there are some Erasmus Plus projects, or they were, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, used to support uh, female students in vocational education and training. So uh, I, I don't know, from your own experience, I am aware that this is not your field, but I, I believe that they would be very helpful um, to promote those projects as well. I don't know. What what do you think? I think it definitely helps. I mean, uh, I know there's a great um, initiative going on now in Iceland that's called uh, Women's Job, hashtag Women's Job, uh, which highlights women doing in unusual or male oriented fields and they, it's been very successful here i think because it really have taken uh, kind of these role models of women that are young and they're studying this and then they're describing why it's important they've done a really good job of highlighting this so any kind of project like that i think it works and i've had teachers i don't have research on this but i've had anecdotal because i, I was um, involved in the program for vocational teachers 
And anecdotally, they say we have a lot more girls after they did that and highlighted that. And so there is some transitions in the gender um, balance, but it seems to be it's going very, very slowly. <laughs> and we still have very gendered uh, fields. Uh, and that's something that we need to investigate and consider more. And, and consider these projects that you're describing. I think they, they apply to most anywhere, really. But just to kind of mention a little bit about, you were talking about uh, introducing students in compulsory education to vocational education. I did ask them, the ones that had chosen that, and the majority had no kind of introduction to that in the compulsory education. So I didn't include that data, but I, I, I saw that that was the case. So that's true. Well, that, that would be very interesting to in investigate then maybe in the future, maybe further research on that, that would be... Uh, very interesting. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's hope that uh, the future will be more bright also for female female students to join uh, vocational education training and maybe also highlight uh, vocational, vocational education and training. And uh, yeah, I would like to thank you, Elsa. And uh, before we close, I would like uh, to remind of some upcoming learning events on the European School Education Platform. Uh, you can either click the links or, of course, you can navigate uh, through the European School Education Platform. You can see some upcoming courses here and uh, some web uh, some webinars. Um, in the following days, um, you will also be able to register for those webinars. And um, I think we can close here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you for having um, me. I enjoyed myself. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much. I hope to see you all uh, in the future in any of our upcoming learning events on the European School Education Platform. Have a nice evening, everyone.